again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot say to you If I don't say the words that maybe it's not true Hi, welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith. As you know, uh, every now and then I like to do something a little bit different on the show and I'm delighted to welcome Blaine Gibson. Hi, Blaine. How are you? I'm okay. How are you, Steve? Very good, mate. Very good. Good to have you on the show. And the reason I've asked you to come on is because I have followed, like millions of people around the world, the story of the flight MH370. Now, this is something which... Uh, is has been shrouded in mystery, and uh, mm. you have essentially uh, come on my radar after uh, reading a lot of things in the newspapers, watching you on documentaries, and seeing you on the news. And um, it fascinated me what you've got involved with. And from my perspective, I wanted to ask you a few questions about it. We 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 backward sure. and forwarded on WhatsApp, um, and and built up a little bit of trust and understanding. You've been kind enough to share a few things with me, which I won't put into the public domain. Um, first of all, I just want, like I always do on these kind of interview reviews, I just want to get to know a little bit more about you within reason. So just just tell us a little bit about where where you come from. You know, a little bit about your upbringing, Blaine. Well, I'm a native-born fifth-generation Californian, but I have lived in Seattle for the last 30 years of my life. And uh, my father was the chief justice of California. So that instilled in me a great sense of justice. Uh, I am a lawyer and uh, I, uh, I've always been interested in traveling and solving mysteries. So that is what has driven me in Malaysia 370 and in many other things. My goal since I was a young kid was to go to every country in the world, and I've been in almost all of them. I've been in 185 out of 195. I've lived uh, part-time or full-time in about 10, and uh, I love travel and adventure and solving mysteries. And the thing about Malaysia 370 is that is a mystery that can bring real answers to people now. To the public who flies, we need to know that when we get on a plane, we're not just going to disappear. And to the families, I mean, I know many of your viewers were friends of John Alder and Liam Sweeney, and uh, we know what happened to them. Uh, it's tragic. Uh, we need to know more. We need to know why. But still, we know something about what happened to them. Imagine for the families in Malaysia 370 who have absolutely no idea what happened to their loved ones. Yeah, tragic. And uh, yeah, thoughts go out, of course, to uh, to, to John Alder and um, to, to, to Sweeney's family because those those people are very close to our heart. But from from your perspective, then, let, you know, tell me tell me when you first heard about MH370. I grew up in. Carmel, California. I was selling the family home. My mother had passed away eight years earlier and I'd kept it for a while, but decided that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life there. And uh, so I was selling the family home, going through all of my old personal items and boxes and memories of me, my mother, my father, uh, aunts, grandmother, everybody. And uh, Suddenly the news broke on CNN that this plane had gone missing. And I just assumed at the beginning that, well, it probably just crashed where it disappeared. But then I saw the mystery unfold. And uh, normally I'm not the type to be glued to a television. I'm out in the field doing everything. But when you're selling a home and going through all your personal items, you sit in front of the television with it on all the time while you're doing what you need to do. So that's what captivated me. And then when I found out that the plane had not crashed where uh, it had disappeared, but had instead uh, crossed the Malay Peninsula to another ocean and then flown into another hemisphere and disappeared, I thought, wow, this is really remarkable. What, what happened here? 
it was it was a tragic tragic circumstance. I remember watching it in in the UK and I remember seeing the news feeds of uh, families, you know, turning up at the airports in in mass hysteria and mass panic. And I think I think from from my perspective, like you do, like millions of people do around the world, you put faith in an airline getting you from A to B. We get we go through passport control, we go through customs, we have our luggage checked, and as we're climbing up those stairs, getting onto a plane, we, we just generally think that. You know, we might have a little bit of nervousness. There are nervous flyers, but we just genuinely put our trust in in, in the in the pilot and the crew, don't we? Yes, we do. And I fly a lot, and my mother flew a lot. And so, as I went through all these family memories and watched this, I just thought about, well, how would I feel if she were on that plane, or how would she have felt if I were on that plane, just not knowing. We know when we get on the plane that there's a very small chance that it could crash. But what does not happen is that it just disappears and nobody knows what happens to us for 10 years. So as you watch the news and you saw the story develop, you know, what drew you to getting more involved? After I helped my friends uh, set up a business and get sort of started in the next part of my life, I uh, got involved in some Facebook groups discussing what happened to Malaysia 370. And I had been very interested because there had been a witness sighting in the Maldives. And I wondered, well, maybe, you know, until debris shows up, we don't know. Maybe that's where the plane went. Maybe it went somewhere else. I was very open to what happened and where the plane was until debris started to show up. And when I started to first get involved, there was no debris at all. We didn't know. All we had was the radar track back, and we had the uh, InMarsat data being analyzed saying that the plane went south. But we didn't have any debris. We didn't have any physical evidence. And so I got involved in the discussion groups, and then uh, some of the family members invited us to participate in the one-year commemoration. And I went there to Kuala Lumpur since I was living in Asia at the time. And uh, I saw a young woman named Grace Nathan speak about her mother. And that brought tears to my eyes because her mother reminded me so much of my mother. I could not imagine how I felt. And that inspired me to do something to solve this mystery because what I found out, and this I was astounded, that no search of beaches and shorelines officially was done. After one year, nothing. Not until the flap around was found did anyone start to search beaches and shorelines, and then not even on the African continent, only in uh, La Réunion and uh, Mauritius did they search. And that to me was totally remiss because I always thought the first piece of this plane that's going to be found is not going to be the underwater wreckage in a multi-hundred million dollar search. It's going to be found by someone just walking on the beach. And that is what happened. It was found by a, a beach cleaner named Johnny Begg in La Réunion, uh, July 29, 2015. Uh, he found the flapper on and that was the first piece of Malaysia 370 that was found. I went there, I went there to look. I went there and met him. And little did I imagine that I would be the one to find the second piece, but that's what happened. Just gonna look at a few photographs because obviously it seems relevant with you talking about that. So if you wanna talk us through some of these photographs that we've got to show here. That's in uh, Riake Beach in Madagascar. That's a piece that I found that uh, they included in the debris report because it's from the plane, but they could not tell exactly where on the plane it was from, which is why sometimes people say, oh, well, it's not confirmed from the plane. Well, they can only confirm a piece of debris from the plane if it has a matching serial number. And the plane is not littered with serial numbers everywhere on it. It has to be a pretty big piece to have a serial number that can be matched. So yeah, I mean, it's from the plane. It has all of the components, the honeycomb, 
the carbon fiber polymer, the Hylock pins with the numbers on it, the Malaysia Airlines uh, colors on it. Uh, but they just could not identify in the case of that piece exactly where on the plane it was from. But many others, they were able to tell exactly where they were from. And we learned a lot about uh, what happened. That is a piece that is the most recent one. Uh, actually, that washed ashore in uh, 2017, early 2017. But I did not see it until 2019 when local people showed it to me. I sent the uh, I sent some pictures to some uh, experts I knew, or at least I thought they were experts, and they said it was nautical. Well, I was pretty sure it wasn't nautical, but uh, that piece, uh, Richard Godfrey has done an analysis of it and believes that it is from the uh, front uh, nose landing gear door, which has 9M MRO. It has the RO written on it, which is distinctive to Malaysia 370. It was 9M MRO was the sign on that plane, while Malaysia 17 was 9M MRD. So that piece uh, is at least symbolic, if uh, Mr. Godfrey's analysis is correct, uh, and it needs to be officially uh, investigated and identified, and then we can learn something from it about how the plane impacted the water. Mm. A couple of other bits um, uh, that we, we, we've got here, a couple of other uh, photographs. These seem to be quite distinctive as that's, well. That's significant because those are five pieces of debris that I found myself. Most of the debris I did not find. Local people found it and brought it to me in response to my messages and to the family's reward. But these five pieces I did find, uh, three of them, on uh, June 6th, uh, two of them on June 12th, on Riake Beach in Madagascar. And that is where and when uh, Professor Chari Patirachi of University of Western Australia advised me when I met him in September 2015, he advised me to go to Madagascar and Mozambique to look for debris about two years after the plane crashed. Uh, those pieces are significant because one of them, if you'll just go back to it a second, uh, on the bottom left, that is the monitor case. That's the one that brought tears to my eyes because that is the case around the television screen on the back of the economy class seat in front of you. And that was very significant because there were people who were claiming, oh, the plane is intact underwater, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is a piece of a seat in the main cabin that shows conclusively that tragically Malaysia 370 shattered on impact with the ocean. The plane is in tens of thousands of pieces, small pieces, and this was a significant one, this monitor case. And if you'll switch to go back just a little bit, you can see the front of it. It's something that everyone will uh, be able to recognize if you can just go back to that other photo with it um, before. Yeah, I'm holding it in the middle. Uh, I mean, that brought tears to my eyes because that's probably the last thing that someone saw. And it's from the cabin. Those others are just parts of an airplane that most people wouldn't recognize, but the one in the middle, you, you do. Yeah, heartbreaking, heartbreaking stuff. And yeah, um, yeah for, you know, for me, you know, you you attended the first anniversary in, in Kuala Lumpur. You met family members of missing passengers. I mean, I mean that must have been a quite emotional. I mean, that, that I presume is what prompted you to, to help more and to go on to go on this mission, if you like. It did, because I've I've gone on other uh, missions uh, because I love exploration and solving mysteries. I worked on uh, archeological expedition in Belize and Guatemala to find out what happened to the Maya. I went to the epicenter where the Tunguska meteorite uh, uh, exploded and flattened all the forest in 1908. I went looking for the lost Ark of the uh, Covenant in, uh, in Ethiopia where the 
Ethiopians claim it's there, and I think it's there too, even though not exactly where they say it is. But those are mysteries that while they're very historically significant, they don't bring real answers to people now. So the thing about Malaysia 370 is I realized that that one year anniversary when I heard Grace speak, how much it would mean if a piece of the plane was found and if that could lead to finding the rest of the plane and unlocking the truth. So I was open to the plane being anywhere when I first started my searches of beaches and shorelines. I, I looked in the Gulf of Thailand. I looked in the uh, Andaman Sea on the coast of Myanmar. I went to the Maldives and talked to the witnesses. But then when the flapper on was found, I knew that the plane crashed in the Southern Indian Ocean. I knew that the, the Inmarsat data was at least approximately right. And uh, we needed to uh, find more debris. So I went and met uh, Professor Chari Patriarachi of the University of Western Australia. I asked him where he thought the plane had crashed. He said that between uh, near the seventh arc, but wider from the seventh arc, about 28 degrees south latitude, 33 degrees south latitude in that area, near a place called Broken Ridge. And he said, if you go to Mozambique and Madagascar about two years after the plane has crashed, that's where the debris will go. And I went there and the rest is history. That led, my meeting with him led directly to uh, recovery of 22 pieces of the plane now. Wow. You know, with you getting involved, how did your friends and family feel about you getting involved in this mission? Uh, I didn't really have any family by then because my mother and father had both uh, passed away. Um, my father was like 68 when I was born and he fought in World War I in the trenches. So uh, uh, they were they were gone. They'd had good long lives, and I didn't really have a family. Uh, my friends um, thought it was great that I had this to follow and this to do, but they also warned me, "Hey, you may be stepping on some toes. You may be poking the dragon in the eye." And uh, boy, did I sure find out that was true. I am astounded at the amount of hostility and hatred that I've run onto directed at me simply because I found and reported some pieces of the plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a it's such a major undertaking for, for anybody to get involved in. Uh, my question uh, immediately was how, how, how do you finance this? Because, you know, it, it, when, when we're talking about it on the podcast, it, it's all right going, yeah, well, I, I go to Malaysia or I go to Kuala Lumpur or I go to here and I go to there. But all of these, all of these things cost money. I mean, are you financing this yourself? I'm totally financing this myself. Remember, I love travel and adventure, and that's what I do anyhow. I love to travel with purpose. Uh, when uh, Professor Patirachi said, go to Madagascar and Mozambique, my first thought, and I said, well, I've already been to Madagascar. That's one of the countries I've been to. Not looking for the plane, but I've already been there. But Mozambique's a new one, and I speak the language, so I'll go there. So I went to Mozambique, and that was where I found my first piece of debris. But as I said, um, when I learned of Malaysia 370 uh, going missing, I was selling the ham family home in Carmel, California, and that was a family home that uh, was worth a considerable amount of money, and that's enough. Uh, I don't spend a lot when I travel. I don't stay in first-class hotels. I like bungalows, I like camping, I like guest houses. I travel kind of like a backpacker. So uh, I don't spend a lot, and if I've got a purpose to it, uh, yeah, I'll just get on a plane and, and go. She mentioned Mozambique there. What what was it like? What did it feel for you uh, emotionally to, to find that first bit of debris? I had been searching uh, beaches and shorelines for about a year, maybe even a little over a year before that, uh, and uh, found nothing. 
And I expected that day that probably I'll find nothing today. And in fact, half the way there, the, the boat broke down and uh, the boatman was very anxious to repair it. And I said, no, don't bother, just take me back. He says, no, we're going. Well, the thing about this sandbank, I had, uh, well, well, Professor Cherry had told me about where to go. You need to ask the local people where things wash ashore from the open ocean. And they know that. There's nobody better than a fisherman, no matter what his level of education, to know where things wash ashore. And it's Africa. So they're looking things of value that are washing ashore because they need them. And so when I asked the local fishermen and boatmen, they said there's a sandbank off the coast of Villanculos where all the fishermen go to collect their buoys and uh, nets, anything they can use. That's the place to go. So that's where I went. And we got there, and as we approached, uh, there were flamingos on the island, and they all flew away, flew away because it's there on it. And uh, the problem with that sandbank is that you can only get in there at medium tide. At high tide, you can't. You'll just be destroyed by the waves. And at low tide, you can't get in at all or off. So there's a very narrow window where you go in and go out. And so we only had about uh, 30 minutes to look uh, on to be on the safe side. And after we'd been looking for about 20 minutes, uh, one of the uh, uh, people I was with uh, called out my name and he was holding this gray triangle, uh, dry, gray triangular object. And I ran over to it and it said no step on it. And I knew immediately it was from the plane. Well, I knew it was from a plane and I felt it was from the plane. It just seemed to be so light to me I, because I had not held pieces of aircraft debris in my hands before. It seemed to be so light, but then it's supposed to be light. It's a, it's a composite. And uh, how did I feel? I was in a country that was torn by civil war. You literally could not go by land at that time from Villanculos to Maputo. You had to fly. So here I am on this sandbank in a, in a country that's torn by civil war, and I've got what I think is the second piece of the greatest aviation mystery in history in my hand. So I needed to be sure to do the right thing. I felt an awesome sense of responsibility. I had to make sure that it, it was uh, documented, that it was handed over, and that it got the attention from the authorities that it would be deserved, that it deserved and would be uh, investigated properly. So I felt an awesome sense of responsibility. Uh, I felt a sense of accomplishment. Uh, People ask me, was I happy? No, happy is not the word. When you're holding in your hands a piece of a plane where 239 people perished, that's not happy. Happy would be if I arrived on that sandbank and saw 239 people grilling seafood, sipping on coconuts, saying, what took you so long? That would be happy. But I felt a sense of accomplishment and responsibility and knew that I needed to do the right thing and get it in the right hands so that it could be investigated and analyzed. Okay, we are halfway through the show. It is time for the ads. Okay. We still do seven NUFC Matters show a week for free. But if you want to help support NUFC Matters, then there are a few ways of doing it. Hit the like button on each live broadcast and video. This helps the channel grow. Hit the subscribe button and select the all notifications bell so you don't miss a single show. If you want to help us financially, then you can join the channel using this button with the membership starting at $1.99 a month. Or you can drop us a donation in the chat using a super sticker. We're also looking for sponsors. If you'd like your brand advertised on the flies for the show and featured during the ad break, then email john at nufcmatters.com to arrange today. A big thanks to all our sponsors, Skips and Bins. You can find them at skipsandbins.com or telephone 0800 25 45 25 3. 
Email inquiries at skipsandbins.com. Website, skipsandbins.com. Easy contract free and pay as you go waste collection. Big thanks to Mr. Vicky's Sources Handmade in Cumbria. You can order them from their website, mrvickies.co.uk or by telephone on 01768 210102. A big thanks also to New Workwear. Uh, you can find them at newworkwear.com. They are an agile and dedicated workwear provider. Welcome back as well to United Travel. Uh, they are a UK coaches firm and they are based in uh, the Northeast. They've got 2024 tours and you can contact them on 01670 632 460 or mobile 0791 4174. Email info at unitedgrouptravel.com and they've got a website which is unitedgrouptravel.com. There's no strangers on there to us, just people you haven't met yet. Big thanks to them for their sponsorship. Big thanks as well to Media Arts and they supply all the video technology. If you want to become a member and get a cup, a pen, a membership card and a scarf, then get your smartphone and put it over this QR code. It will take you straight to the membership pack. It's a £25 one-off fee. You can also go to NUFC Matters website and search membership pack to book today. If you want to help the channel, then subscribe to it by hitting the subscribe button. Hit the thumb up under the video to like the video and click share to share to your other social media. We're also available as a podcast on iTunes, Spotify and other podcast providers. Don't forget, we help the food bank on this channel. If you want to do so virtually, go to nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk and make a donation today. The Alan Sheila raffle is back on. 150 tickets, £1 a ticket, win a limited edition signed Alan Shearer ball. End of the day at nufcmatters.com. Okay, welcome back to this NUFC Matters special with Blaine Gibson, who uh, we've been talking about the uh, the disappearance of flight MH370. Uh, interesting story, this very interesting story. And I just wanted to get uh, Blaine on really to uh, to highlight it, to keep it in the in the public domain. Um, we've been talking about, you know, parts of the aircraft have been found. I mean, has there been any more parts of the aircraft being found recently, Blaine? Uh, well, not recently. Uh for one thing, I want to clarify after the Netflix uh, show, which it was a show, not a documentary, uh, there are a lot of pieces of the plane that were found by people who were totally unrelated to me in six different countries, including three pieces confirmed by matching serial numbers. Uh, the most significant piece, the Tanzania wing flap, those were all found. Uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, by uh, local people in six different countries. And that's totally unrelated to me. Netflix seemed to want to forget that. They seemed to want to make it look like I had found all the pieces. And uh, so a lot of people after seeing it even thought I found the flapper, on, even though it was found by a beach cleaner in La Réunion. So there's a lot more pieces of debris out there. Recently, the only ones since COVID, because I was not able to go to Madagascar during that whole COVID period, are a couple pieces that uh, I retrieved uh, that had washed ashore in 2017 that were kept by local people and used as uh, washing boards uh, because the people who find debris will use it for whatever they can. And uh, that was true before, and that's true now. So there may still be some pieces of debris out there that people are using for a fence or a washing board or a roof or something. We don't know. And again, there weren't, was never an official search of the African coastline, even though the African countries were uh, willing to conduct one. Madagascar especially proposed it. And uh, unfortunately, the officials, the bureaucrats, uh, wouldn't pay for it and do it. So a lot of debris was lost. A lot was missed because of that. 
But the most recent piece to actually wash ashore that I know of was in uh, August of 2018, and I handed that in to uh, Minister Loke in uh, the end of uh, November 2018. Uh, there was a piece of debris, the spoiler from the wing that was found by a surfer during COVID uh, in, the, uh, in South Africa. Uh, it was delivered to Malaysia, but nothing from Malaysia, no investigation, no publication. Two pieces of debris that uh, I had uh, handed in to be delivered in 2017 uh, didn't get delivered because the consul, the official responsible for picking them up, was assassinated before he could pick them up. And so that debris I managed to get released to Madagascar in 2019, uh, from Madagascar to Malaysia. It was uh, sent by courier by Madagascar. However, unfortunately, no investigation, no publication, nothing from Malaysia. The, the last three pieces of debris that have been delivered to Malaysia have not been investigated and published at all. Then recently, in December 22, I found a piece uh, that I collected from a local fisherman. Uh, his wife had been using it as a washing board. I handed that in in Madagascar, uh, December 22, 2022. And I remember the day very well because while I was handing it in, my hotel room was broken into by someone probably trying to get the debris. They stole my notebook with all my notes. But fortunately, I was not in the hotel room. I was handing it in to the Madagascar authorities. And then after that, a whole bunch of people, not just the usual suspects, Jeff Wise, Florence de Changi, who say that none of this debris is from the plane. But there were uh, scientists I knew, uh, members of the independent group, like uh, Exner, Ionello, and Thompson, were claiming this is from the Team Vestas racing yacht. Well, that's ridiculous because the Vestas wind yacht debris would have arrived in two months, not three years. This was clearly aircraft debris. And not only was it clearly aircraft debris, it was clearly from a 777, from Malaysia 370. Uh, and it had in it three, four parallel slices, probably of the engine blades, slicing through this debris when the plane impacted the water. I have seen lots of pieces of debris. I've held many pieces of that plane in my hand. I know one when I see one, feel one, and touch one. I have never seen anything with those cuts in it before. It's a major significant piece. But after these people started to make these crazy claims that it was from the uh, a Vestas wind yacht, which was totally wrong. After they made those claims, uh, Malaysia had an excuse to not pay for delivery of the debris, not do the investigation. So it's still sitting in good hands, safely in Madagascar, but they don't have the capacity to investigate it. It's Malaysia's responsibility. This investigation on your behalf hasn't come without issues. And what I really found hard to believe um, is that you've received trolling, death threats, um, you know, pretty serious death threats and, and, and threats to life yes. since you started your search for the truth. Why do you think this has happened and, and how has this affected you, Blaine? They have been serious death threats. I, uh, my friend received a phone call uh, when I was in Madagascar in 2016. He got a phone call from someone who was connected with the local mafia uh, saying that I would not leave Madagascar alive. And uh, I got a threat uh, recently saying, even your American science friends say your debris is from a boat. The next plane you fly on is, is, is going to disappear like Malaysia 37. I get threats like that. I get messages like no plane, no blame. Uh, one uh, 
person using an assumed name posted that uh, I would either uh, give up, disappear, have an accident, or die by polonium poisoning. Well, polonium poisoning is a very signature Russian tactic. I mean, Putin's main rival, Litvinenko, was taken out with polonium in, uh, in London. So it's pretty clear where that came from. And uh, they have been serious. Um, I helped with the 370 families in Madagascar and Malaysia arrange a protocol whereby any debris handed in in Madagascar would be collected by the honorary Malaysian consul and uh, transported by courier to Malaysia for investigation. When that was in place, I was told to go ahead and, and have my friend hand in a couple pieces of debris that Malaysia was interested in. One had been uh, identified from photographs as the uh, base plate of the vortex generator. That's when you, you're sitting on the plane and you're looking at the engine, there's a little uh, fin that sticks out towards you. It was the base plate of that. So that showed that the engine shattered on impact. And uh, so we handed those in. And uh, a week later, before he could pick the debris up, the consul was assassinated. And it wasn't like a robber. It was a hit. It was a professional hit. His money, his documents were not taken. It was a hit. And so that's scary. And, and that's why... Those two pieces of debris didn't make it out of Madagascar for two years. And that's why I couldn't really hand in that one that the O panel that looks like it's the O from 9MMRO. Couldn't hand that one in. Nobody was accepting any debris. Malaysia didn't want it. Madagascar didn't want it if Malaysia wasn't going to take it. And they were investigating the assassination of the consul. People were afraid. The word got out. People are not stupid. They are not naive. When the consul gets assassinated before he can pick up and deliver the debris, uh, the word gets out. It definitely puts a damper on the delivery and investigation of the debris. Yeah, I mean, you know, trolling and, and stuff like that is serious, but threats to kill, it, it, it makes you question things. Uh... The trolling has been serious. Uh, I know where some of it's coming from. There's a massive character assassination and disinformation campaign, not only against me, but also against Inmarsat. I mean, you saw that in the, in the Netflix show. I mean, Inmarsat came forward with this information that had never been used before and it, and, and it never been done or foreseen before, and they managed to figure out about where the plane went. That was pretty good. The debris confirmed that the plane went south. The debris confirmed that the Inmarsat analysis of the BFO and BTO was correct. So then I would think that people who had theories that the plane was in Kazakhstan or the South China Sea, you know, this is not about their theories and their books. At that point, they should say, oh, okay, well, it didn't go north, it went south. Let's, let's now figure out who took it and why. And let's figure out who assassinated the consul. And let's figure out who is running this character assassination and disinformation campaign against me and others who find and report debris and others who uh, produce evidence of what happened to this plane. You know, I mentioned that my father was the chief justice of California. Well, he told me it's not the crime that gets the criminal caught. It's the cover up. Find out who is behind this troll trail attacking me, threatening me, attacking the debris, attacking everyone who tries to find and produce evidence of what happened to this plane. Follow the money. Find out who's behind that, and you may very well figure out what happened to Malaysia 370 before we can find the black box. The landing gear debris that was found points to a theory that one of the pilots might have crashed the plane deliberately. But what do you believe happened, Blin? Well, for one thing, I have never been convinced, even though it is the leading theory, 
I've never been convinced that uh, either of the pilots, or especially Captain Shaw, because he's the one who's accused, uh, that he did this as a premeditated uh, uh, mass murder suicide. I, I simply find nothing in his background that indicates he would do this. Whereas in the other cases of pilot suicide, uh, German wings, silk air, there were definitely things in the backgrounds of, of those, in that case, co-pilots that uh, were warning signs that were overlooked and should have been heeded. And so it all fits together. Nothing like that with Captain Shaw. His life has been under a microscope. I mean, so what if he liked uh, uh, young, hot Vietnamese models on the internet? That's a sign of someone who wants to live, not someone who wants to die. So I just don't buy into that at all. Uh, there is evidence that he did it. Uh, the simulator is not conclusive because it was, if it was a route, it was just one route flown out of many. So while I am open to that possibility, and it is the leading theory, I, I've never been convinced of it. As far as the landing gear go, goes, that piece that I call the Tatali debris, it's definitely from the plane. It definitely has slices in it when the plane impacted the water. The question is where on the plane it was from. Richard Godfrey analyzed it and thought it was from the, the small uh, Trunnion landing gear door. Others have disputed that. Boeing looked at some photographs and said, no, we don't think it's from the Trunnion door. Uh, fine, okay. Then send it to the experts, let it be investigated, and see where on the plane it is from. Don't make ridiculous claims like some people out there on the internet are doing, that it's from MH17, or that it's from a boneyard somewhere, or that it's from an Airbus or another Boeing that crashed in the southern Indian Ocean, or that it's from the Team Vestas wind yacht, which is one of the most ridiculous claims at all. Just let's send it to the officials in Malaysia and let them investigate identify it, determine where on the plane it was from, and especially what was the cause of those four slices. Now, if it, if it is the landing gear door, and they've already said from photographs that it isn't, um, even though experts disagree, that's why it needs to be physically examined. Um, then that would be very significant uh, if it indicated that someone was flying the plane at the end. This has been one of the big debates. Was it a ghost flight when it uh, crashed or was it piloted until the end? And the reason there's a big debate, it's not just academic. To me, I'm, I'm fine to, let's find the debris and then find out if someone was flying. The reason it's significant is in this analysis of the seven arcs, and the, which is basically the longitude where the plane crashed. Uh, that would help pinpoint the location, but if it was a controlled uh, glide piloted till the end, it might be wider from the seventh arc than previously thought. However, it was a dive straight down, piloted or unpiloted, a dive straight down, it's probably pretty close to the arc and that area has been searched and the plane wasn't there. So that's why it's significant. I'm interested in what happened and who was flying, uh, if it's gonna help us find the plane and get the truth and the proof. And uh, speculating about whether it was the captain or another member of the crew or a third party hijacking uh, only helps us get there if it helps us locate the crash site. Have you any expeditions planned in, in the next few months, Blaine? Is there anything now that you're working on which um, you know the viewers would find of interest, which you can, which you're prepared to tell us about? I don't want to, I don't want you to divulge anything that's going to put you at risk with all of these people there uh, being for your blood over something, which I find crazy. I really do. But is there anything you can divulge or share with the listeners and viewers? Okay. Well, I will share this. I I do not currently have any plans. 
to go anywhere looking for debris. Uh, however, I would, if I got a significant report of debris, uh, I would be ready to go. Uh, if I did have those plans specifically, I would probably say, yes, I do, but I'm not going to say when they are. And I didn't say that. So right now I don't have those plans, but if something surfaces, um, I would. Uh, the problem is there are 41 pieces of debris. Only 33 are in the official Annex 13 report because others were never were either never delivered or delivered and not investigated. I don't know, maybe not handed in because other people found some of them. And the problem is that the last four that have been handed in, three of them made their way to Malaysia and they've done no investigation at all. So there's, it's like a dead end. It's like a bottomless pit. It's just the debris is just gone. You may as well just leave it on the beach and not take the chance. And then this significant piece of debris, the Tadali debris, is in good care in Madagascar, but Malaysia has not yet paid for delivery and doesn't appear to have any interest in doing so. So what's the, what's the point? And, and when even scientist experts come out and join the fringe conspiracy theorists and make silly claims that the debris is from a boat, uh, what's the point in continuing? The million dollar question, Blin. Will the truth ever come out, do you think? That the truth of what happened to Malaysia 370 will come out. I also believe that the plane will be found, that the wreckage of the plane will be found underwater and uh, will be recovered. And in finding that, we will know much more than we do now. We may never know the whole truth, but I believe the truth will come out. Uh, just as with Malaysia 17, I believe that the truth will come out. We know much more about what happened to Malaysia 17 uh, than we do about Malaysia 370. However, uh, we do not know if there was any sort of link between the two planes between the two tragedies. One has not been found, uh, but it's possible there may be. Uh, we do not know, and the tribunal could not conclude uh, if the Russian separatists were deliberately targeting a civilian airliner or if it was a case of mistaken identity. The tribunal concluded that it was probably mistaken identity because they couldn't imagine any reason why. They said it was implausible that uh, a civilian airliner would be shot down deliberately. But again, we don't know. And I think that the families of both planes need to know the truth and the whole truth of what happened. And I think that eventually that will happen. It needs justice for the families, really, Blaine. That's, that, I think, you know, we, we started talking about the families at the start of the podcast. We'll finish off with that. We we, we need justice for the families because they are sitting in limbo. Um, you, you know, they don't know what the, you know, what the outcome is. They don't know how, you know, how their their families have perished. And, and, and it, it is human nature that when you don't have an answer to that kind of question, that you will always have hope. And unfortunately, some of these people will still have the hope that, Somewhere out there, their family members are still alive and well and, 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 you know, clinging to some kind of existence. And those people will cling to those kind of hopes. And that in itself is, it, it's cruel to do that to, to, to those people back home. And the thing is, I know that many of the Chinese believe that their loved ones are still alive. And that's their right. It's not my place or anyone's place to question that. We all deal with grief and loss the way we need to. And the responsibility is for Malaysia, China, 
Australia, the international community, the aviation industry, to give them those answers uh, so that they know if their loved ones are definitely dead, to give them some evidence, to give them some proof, to give them more than there is now. And they are entitled to do that. And uh, I think one thing that I want to say to your audience, especially because I know that a lot of you are close to this because you lost friends and family on Malaysia 17, is that imagine if you knew nothing of what happened to that plane. And think of this, it is quite a coincidence that two sister planes, one disappeared and one was shot down within the space of three months. Coincidences do happen. It may just be bad luck, but how can we know for sure? Well, I believe that the search for Malaysia 370 needs to be resumed to give the families and the flying public answers of what happened to Malaysia 370 so that it never happens again, so that we can take steps to ensure that, but also finding the plane, the black box, finding the cause of Malaysia 370 might give us evidence that there either was no connection between these two tragedies or that there may have been. And so I think that anyone who wants the truth and justice for families for Malaysia 17 and in any aircraft tragedy should be behind resuming the search and finding the plane and unlocking the mystery of Malaysia 370. The flying public, many family members have told me how they feel and tried to, but even though I've gotten to know them and they've some of them become good friends, I cannot imagine how they feel. I cannot put myself in their place. But one thing they consistently say is don't just do this for us. Do this for the flying public. Do this for everyone who flies and seeks justice. Because any one of us could have been on that plane. It was just bad luck. And any one of us could be. So we need to resume the search and solve this mystery for the families and for the public and everyone who flies. The quest for answers for MH370 continues. Uh, Blaine yes. Gibson, that has been a fantastic interview, mate. Thank you very much for your time. Best of luck, and let's hope we get justice for the families. Thanks for joining me. Yes, we will. Thank you, and thank you for bringing this to everybody's attention, because my greatest fear is that 370 is just going to be forgotten. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.